Hey folks, uh, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a friend of mine in called Jonathan Tobin, who is a venture capital guy uh, working in biotech. So we had a really cool chat. Uh, we looked at what is biotech. Uh, we talked about invention, science, biology, drugs, chemistry, all of that cool stuff. Uh, we looked a little bit about uh, how the industry is funded, uh, what it takes to get drugs to market. It's a really, really cool chat and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. And we are live. How are you doing? Hey, Lewis. Yeah, good. Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's right. Very excited. So I feel like we have to talk about CrossFit first as we met sweating next to each other. Indeed. In Very some romantic. Hard, some hard wads somewhere. <laughs> How long have you been doing it for? Um, I think I started about a year and a half ago. I'd been doing cycling since I was about 19 and um, had sort of developed pretty decent quads, but the rest of my body was <laughs> shriveled and skinny. So I thought I needed, before cycling. I became middle-aged, to uh, redress that balance. So why, why did you do, do CrossFit? I think it's it's varied... Uh, it seemed like a kind of new challenge. I was into weightlifting sort of earlier on in my life and, um, you know, I thought Before it was 19. Cover. Yeah. And, and also after I'd had two, then three children, it was something that you could do. Three you know, children. It didn't take your whole weekend yeah. kind of thing. No, it's true. It's true. No, the cycling, because I've done a bit of cycling. You're out for like, what, two, three hours yeah. or whatever. But then you get back and you spend two or three hours on the couch and then two or <laughs> three hours <laughs> eating. So in actual fact, you're a waste of space for the whole oh, day. Oh, completely, completely. <laughs> but you could be doing golf. Golf's a good four or five hour it, it's true. out for the whole, yeah. the whole Well, day. cycling's the sort of new golf, the aerobic golf. Yeah, but you've got to get a good few hours in otherwise. The thing with CrossFit, though, it's like 20 minutes and you're like dribbling on the floor. Yeah, yeah. You can just do it really And you great. don't have to spend £5,000 on a bike. No, so. that is true. That is true. So you are in biotech. Yep, I'm in uh, biotech venture capital, which is a fairly niche sector in Europe, particularly. What so is biotech? Biotech is, uh, I mean, tech biotechnology is using living organisms to basically to make things. Um, but but it's now evolved into what I do which is creating new drugs based on new forms, new discoveries in biology. Nice. And biotech over the last 40 years now, 50 years, has really transformed medicine. So, the f- In what way? So the first biotech company was Genentech, which, which started in the 70s. Um, and they basically figured out a way of making insulin using um, bacteria which you can grow in a lab you know in a fermenter instead of taking it from animals like pigs and that really paved the way for totally transforming the way a lot of medicines were made and it created a whole breed of entrepreneurs biotech entrepreneurs so scientists biochemists molecular biologists who were also um interested in business and i think i found myself in that category um having grown up you know with business in my family but with a strong interest in science Uh, okay so biotech is like a perfect way to combine those two interests yeah and so before the first biotech company was it all government universities no, I mean, the, the pharmaceutical industry is, is very old. You know, a lot of the companies like Merck and Bayer and yeah. Wellcome go back, you know, hundreds of years. A lot of the first pharma companies actually made chemicals like um, dyes yeah, or, yeah. you know, industrial chemicals and then realized that they could use those skills in chemistry to make things like, you know, aspirin or penicillin. Um, and then the biotech industry really spawned out of people who were thinking differently about using biology to create new medicines. Fine. And then so how is how is it different from tech, the tech sector? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think there are there are quite a few differences actually, and you know, historically, people that did my job who invested in startups invested in both biotech and tech, oh, and right. now there's been a, a big separation of those firms because they're quite different business models. So, biotech is generally biotech founders are generally boffins, professors right. <laughs> coming out of. So in, they're in a university. Yeah, they've done some research. They've come a, up with a some. lot of the time. That's the case, and they're not necessarily people who have the best business skills. Yeah, um, and so they're not the ideal founders of companies. They they have the scientific foundation, but not the business foundation. And so you often get a scientist who will team up with somebody more entrepreneurial. Um, and it, it often, often these days, that's actually the investor who teams up with the scientist. So, so, and, and so, where do they meet? So, the investors are what, circling around the universities, trying to sniff out. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and that's a large part of my job is is doing that basically and finding those ideas. Yeah. Um, and and then identifying what we think could be a great a great drug in five years you know with with a bit of work and then bringing in professional management with the scientists and we, we've right. done that successfully quite a few times but in tech you know you tend to have a founder entrepreneur who has an idea it's relatively cheap to get to a prototype quite quickly yeah um, and so the funding model is quite different there's a lot more angel or sweat equity that goes into yeah, creating yeah. the first iteration and the VCs get involved once there's already something tangible, Fine. even Maybe revenue. Like a proof case or something. Yeah. Whereas biotech is so expensive to make a drug, you might need $50 million just to get wow. to the point where you're testing it in people instead wow. of mice. So how come? So, so what? So they, well, I guess, how do they invent it and how do they test it and where's all, where does the cost come? Yeah, I guess, you know... You're dealing with hugely complex systems. Biology is amazingly complicated, and that's why I think it's so fascinating. But you're trying to identify a specific point of leverage in a cell or in a system uh, which is perturbed in a particular disease setting, and then identify a molecule, a drug that can... Um, shift how that how that target is operating and and change the course of somebody's disease or even cure it and um, and that is extremely complicated and then you need to te do do tests in animals you have to make sure it's safe because you're ultimately yeah. going to be putting the thing into humans and then human trials are really expensive right right um and very time consuming. And then there's the whole regulatory side, which you which don't is have. varies from country to country, I guess. And mm. Crazy. So what what are the hot areas at the moment? Are there any particular <laughs> kind of sweet spots? Yeah. Trying to make our lives longer. <laughs> better. Yeah, lo longevity nano, is an nano, in interesting topic. Nano probes in our body fighting off all our disease and Yeah. So I think there are two areas where typically over the last 10 years, venture capitalists have, have made their best returns and therefore continue to be the sort of the bulk of the deal flow. And that's in cancer, oncology and rare diseases or genetic diseases. Right, right. And the reasons for that, I think, are that those two areas go quite well with how we do science. So our in reductionist approach to science where you take a cell and you tinker with one thing at a time it's sort of like opening a car bonnet and taking one piece out the right. engine and seeing what happens and both cancer is a disease where cells divide uncontrollably so if you can stop them dividing and if you can kill the cells then you cure the disease effectively and in the last few years people have realized that you can harness the body's immune system to attack the tumor and that's been a massively uh, exciting area. Is that developed? Is that developing quickly? It's developing extremely quickly. I mean, quicker than people know what to do with it, because people are now working on the third, fourth, fifth iteration of drugs, and at the same time, still testing the first and second iteration oh, wow. in humans. But then, at the moment, you still 
people have cancer, they they do the chemo stuff, right? Yeah. So these are these new drugs you're talking about, like available. Yeah. Yeah. Some this? some of them are, and most of the time now people are using combination therapy, and that right. makes things even more diff- difficult because rather than testing one thing at a time, you're testing lots of things. Um, and and the other area I think that that is massively um, hot is is rare diseases, and the reason for that is that you know if you have a an inherited disease, there's usually one gene that has gone wrong that you've in, you've inherited that from your parents and therefore you can specifically identify the cause of the disease so it's very simple and you can use gene therapy to put it back in or now gene editing to edit your genome so you've got that crispr yeah nine or whatever it is yeah. yeah that was in the news recently with the old um the designer babies from china it's crazy so it's basically just cut and paste right yeah, just take something out. Put it... And people are extremely scared about the potential ramifications for that. You could do all sorts of things with. I mean, in that case, they've made some children who are, will be resistant to HIV. Oh yeah, I heard in China was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were twins that were born That's it. in. But, but the doctor did it illegally. Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, editing human embryos past you know a very very early <laughs> stage of development is is unethical. But, you is know, there a definition of of that, or is that just open to? Yeah, yeah. Is there an actual definition? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But science is moving so quickly, and you can't. You know, every scientific discovery has an equal and opposite. You know, poor. You know, unethical use. You know, bi- biological weapons are effectively made with biotechnology. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, GM crops. You know, controversial in the news, but could solve you know humankind's food shortage and uh, and so on but is this this is inevitable though right i mean if you can if you can edit your embryo and make your kid resistant to disease run faster smarter you know if other people are doing it you're yeah. gonna end up wanting to do it yourself is this just in, is this inevitable or do you think actually you know there might be some regulation. I think I think what 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 will happen is that people will realize that there are quite a lot of risks associated with rummaging around in the <laughs> primordial soup of an embryo's <laughs> genome and you know it happened well Dolly the sheep was the first animal that was cloned and and I think when was that in the that was in the 90s I think it was a long yeah. time ago but the 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 same thing will happen with with gene editing it's i think there will be especially with when you're editing at the embryo level you there will be um quite a lot of side effects that you just can't predict at yeah, the moment yeah. people are pursuing gene editing for um particular cell types in the body so you're delivering on humans or yeah so you're delivering it to the eye to correct for example an inherited form of blindness right, or you're right. delivering it to the liver for you know liver disease for example you're not editing an embryo so that it has a higher IQ or whatever which wouldn't be possible at the moment but in the future when we understand how these things work you know i'm sure anything will be possible yeah and so with tech and biotech <coughs> going so quick. How how can you as an investor predict <coughs> what's going to happen in the next, well, six months or three years or yeah. whatever time horizon you tend to... I think that's a great question. And it's something that people, people often talk about what's hot right now. But as an investor, you really need to, as um, Ronald Cohen said, look at where the second bounce of the ball is yeah, going to I read be. That. Did you? Yeah. yeah. I read that before I started my business. Yeah. Because he went to school with my dad uh-huh. randomly. <clears throat> well, they're both from Egypt. Yeah. And then they came to the UK and they went to school together. And he ended up doing a lot better than, than my dad. Although my <laughs> dad did well. <laughs> yeah, it was actually the first book I read on venture capital. I think I'm, yeah. I must have been an undergrad or something. He's like the founding father of private equity in Europe. Right? Yeah, yeah. But But that point about timing really struck a chord because... It's very, very difficult and uncomfortable to write a check in something which doesn't feel hot at the moment. It's always easier to follow the crowd, follow the current trend. 
Um, but the question is, where are things going to go to? A- a- and it's all about the time frame. So if you'd invested in gene therapy 10 years ago, yeah. you would have been slightly too early. If you'd right. invested in gene therapy three or four years ago, you'd make 10 times your money now. And but three so, years ago. So ready. So the window of opportunity can be very small. And it's not necessarily best to be first, because when you're first in a new area of technology, there are always, you know, the the old hype cycle where you have the the peak and then the trough of despair when people realize that there are, (laughs) you know, problems associated (laughs) that you, you hadn't foreseen. And then people figure out how to solve those problems and and the thing actually works. But often the people who are first in uh, don't necessarily do the best so figuring out exactly when to get into an area not too early not too late is is a real skill and quite frankly there's a lot of luck involved and also i guess who you get in with right because presumably you know the science teams in different unis are also researching the same stuff there's a little bit of a race to yeah, there's always any, anything that that you're working on. If it's interesting, you can be guaranteed there are three people, other people working on that you know about, and another <laughs> five that you don't know about. <laughs> right. And you know, capital for innovation is quite abundant at the moment, even in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Which was yeah. typically a bit more of a desert for for cash. So, what has it changed recently? It's changed. It. The the amount of capital available in Europe has increased quite significantly over the last three years. <clears throat> it's it's a question about whether the quality and quantity of deal flow justifies the quantum of capital. But one of the things with with biotech is that a lot of the research and the fundamental innovations are funded by government or public sources, and that is fairly steady level of funding and the the discoveries that come out of that are somewhat serendipitous that they're, they're not they don't come at regular intervals and so what you find is because the f- private funding environment goes in booms and busts because biotech yeah. is very volatile and and the economy in general is volatile that you might have a point in which there's a surplus of capital but a deficit of ideas but because funds have cash and they need to deploy the cash oh, i see i see it may, you may get lower quality ideas getting too much funding oh, I see. and vice versa so what are the kind of time frames so you you raise you raise a fund mm-hmm. then do you have a certain you have what 3 years or 5 years to invest the money or how does it depends on the structure of the firm most venture capital firms are set up as 10 year funds and so that means you have 10 years to invest all the money and return all of it and more to your to within your the 10 years investors depends on the structure but yeah, 10 yeah. or 12 years sometimes Fine. 15 years then you have uh, what are called evergreen funds where you're constantly investing and then you return that cash into the fund and then reinvest it. I see, fine. And then there are also growingly uh, corporate venture capital firms where the large, in most cases, pharmaceutical companies have their own VC fund in-house. Has that been a recent development? It's been something that's growing quite a bit and it reflects a trend in the industry where big companies are getting worse and worse at inventing new stuff. And it's cultural, right? If you're in a huge organization, it's very difficult to have that culture of invention and innovation. Why do you think that is? I mean, it's it's, it's a... (laughs) probably a longer discussion but i guess it's to do with hierarchy and organizational structure and reporting and politics i guess if you've got a company with a hundred thousand people it's quite difficult to let people go off on their own flight of fancy maybe but then you have you know you have or apple yeah when steve jobs was there was yeah super yeah innovative no it happens Amazon seemed to be quite innovative yeah, Google, yeah. it does happen so there are companies like gen and tech where that happens they but they're rare and Fine, i yeah. think it's pretty amazing when you get a company that has the scale and resources 
of a huge organization but the culture of a small organization yeah 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 and that will come that comes from the top right I yeah mean. and you find that those companies are hugely productive in terms of the number of new drugs that they that they invent and bring to market yeah and that's driven well and are you finding though that so the leaders of these companies are, are business people rather than scientists or inventors or actually they tend to be people with phds or mds who have spent some time doing research and so have a deep understanding of the science and can communicate that because a lot of our business is about telling stories and yeah, yeah. a lot of you know the people who are good at pitching who are good at selling ideas not just in biotech but i guess generally oh, they're, yeah. they're yeah. telling a story that strikes a chord and convinces people you know hooks their attention absolutely absolutely we actually did some storytelling training on friday we had a lady that came in who specializes in storytelling in business uh -huh. and she did a day training with us because i completely agree it's all about you know you buy into someone's story yeah and and you start feeling a real affinity and you yeah. go along on that journey with them and it's completely yeah it's really funny i, <laughs> I was great. reading i've been reading my four-year-old uh george's marvelous medicine oh, yeah. by roald dahl the last few nights and it it's amazing actually because obviously it's a children's book and the story is a little weird but <laughs> the, well, i think he was probably on drugs when he was <laughs> writing it <laughs> probably was <laughs> But it, you know, the the gist of it is is somewhat similar to to what by bio, how biotech companies invent new drugs. You sort of mix up a recipe and then test it and then tweak it and test it. Yeah, yeah. And um, but the way that that the story is told uh, is obviously very very fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so it's all about how you tell the story. So it's not enough just to have some great data. You yeah, need yeah. to tell the story of that. What does data. it mean? And yeah 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 so then okay so then the best leaders of these companies so science background but then also i guess uh into business yeah and i think it you know going back to our crossfit and uh discussion it's somewhat similar you there's no point being amazing at the science but terrible at presenting the story or understanding the business yeah because you know it's a bit like having a 400 kilo squat but not being able to run a mile kind yeah, of thing. yeah 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 so you have to be quite good at everything and um that's one of the things that attracted me about uh going into biotech venture capital being that jack of all trades kind of thing i remember very clearly when i was working in the lab um i was probably about 24 or 25 and i showed my cv to the careers advisor um <laughs> about you know, for jobs going into science. And she looked at my CV and said, oh, your CV is fine, but it, it it sounds like you're too rounded a person. You've got all this stuff about business, sports, you know, extracurricular things. She said, just get rid of all that. Get rid of all that. And, you know, concentrate on the fact that you're just a hardcore nerd. Uh, <laughs> and I sort of thought, you know, that that's interesting. You're sort of asking me to erase half of my personality and skill set, which yeah. I actually value quite a bit. So did you think of yourself then as a as a what a scientist do you know you wanted to go into business yeah i was always interested in the business applications of science right right and i think it's been the last 20 years or so that the kind of cottage industry of biotech has really taken off and because there's been this shift from um, pharmaceutical companies doing invention in-house to external externalizing research and development that's really meant that the biotech industry has taken off yeah, yeah. because the pharma company there's an ecosystem now the pharma companies buy that innovation from the small biotechs are there a lot of, and there are a lot of so there are a lot more small biotechs now oh yeah there's there thousands um even so, so how does it work? So you touched on it a little bit. So a scientist in the uni comes up with an idea, invents something. He finds some fun or she finds some funding. Mm -hmm. And then you get in at that stage. Are you the funding that they find? Or they've got it going a bit. They've got some data. They've got mm. a bit of a story to tell. Yeah, we. I like to get in quite early. And there's a few reasons for that. 
partly because if you get in early then valuations are lower you're taking more risk but you can have a higher ownership of the company partly because you have a lot more influence and um, guidance in how the science develops if you get in at the beginning when the thing is embryonic yeah but there are also cases where you want to get in once the thing's been de-risked and so if something's already been tested in humans and you've seen that it you know there's there's a chance that it will work then that's that's later stage investing and is that so in terms of managing your risk and making money from these these things so to manage your risk a bit you come in a little bit later once some trials have done yeah and what what a lot of investors do including our firm is that you have a bit of both so you have a portfolio so our portfolio is very focused only on the biotech sector and that's why our investors invest in us because we're specialists in that yeah, sector. Yeah. But we try and hedge the risk somewhat by having some very early stage, almost science projects, which uh, could you know swing of the bat. So if they yeah, yeah. work, you know, it will be um, yeah. a home run. If if they don't work, then you know you miss the ball and you're out, kind of thing. But you <laughs> try and do what they call the killer experiments early, so that you're sequentially discharging risk yeah um and and asking a question and if it's yes then you move on to the next question and then the next question and it gets sequentially more expensive but you get more confidence that okay things, that, you're... that things working yeah and then you raise more money at a higher valuation and so on um and so we have a a mix of those projects and then much later stage projects where you've got the thing that's already being tested in you know what's called phase two or phase three trials in humans and then we have companies that have one project where it's what's called a single asset so you're making like one one drug or something yeah yeah and and if that thing works then you know you'll be successful if it doesn't it fails and then others where you have an individual company has a pipeline of assets it has lots of different projects or it has a platform technology so for example a way of making a drug that you know lasts longer in the body so you only have to have an injection once a month instead of once a week kind of thing and then you can apply that to lots of different drugs and you know those are different business models Uh, if you have a platform technology you have more of a business you can you can sell individual assets you can float the company there's more options for what you can do yeah yeah and so we, we fit the business model to what makes sense for the science basically fine and also the the management you know so if you have a company that's just a science project then maybe you don't need a ceo that has a business background maybe it's maybe you don't even need a ceo it's just a a scientist yeah yeah um but if you have a a more uh, complex organization then you need a more sophisticated management team and are they are they looking to you just for cash or also expertise because you mentioned you know having some influence on the science but presumably these scientists are quite protective over their over their research and their stuff do they want your help and guidance or just give me the cash and check me check in every month (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i think the earlier you get involved in the company the more influence you have and we always i always take a seat on the company's board of directors we're quite involved in the strategy so not necessarily designing individual experiments because you're trusting the the scientific team that you hire that they'd be much better than that than than me um but we're involved with the strategy what direction to take the science in often the there's what's called an innovator's dilemma where you have an invention and you could take it down all sorts of routes and the scientist always wants to try everything because it's interesting yeah yeah. but you've got limited funding and doing a bit of everything doesn't really create much value so you have to be strategic about where you focus your effort and and cash and then i'm quite involved in hiring very involved in building the team so finding you know the chief scientist the ceo uh, the chief business officer finding independent experts that can guide the company and those people that you bring in are absolutely critical because ultimately you don't invest in science you invest in people yeah yeah Um, and having the right people are 
necessary for success. And so you're instrumental in trying to create the right culture within. Yeah. And that's something we can control because the science ultimately is science. It's it's nature. Yeah. Um, and so as investors, one thing that we can do to maximize the chance of success once you've got comfortable with taking a scientific risk is making sure you've got the best people involved in something. Um, we use our own networks and a whole bunch of headhunters to help build those teams. But that's something that I spend an awful lot of my time doing and making sure we get right. Because in a small company, if you get the team wrong, then it, it can be game over pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. scientific failure is accepted. It's part of our game. Yeah, yeah. But failure because a team has fallen out or, you know, hasn't wor worked well together and you haven't identified those problems early on and helped rectify them, you know, it is unacceptable, basically. And is that science or art? Trying it's, to get the... it's, it's all art. <laughs> there's abs I mean, I don't, need, I don't really bother with all the psychometric stuff. I'm sure there's something to it, but ultimately it's do you do just do a gut feel yeah it's yeah. it's hard to tell if somebody has the right technical skills and i think also in our business because we hire a lot of people from big companies big pharmaceutical well, companies into, into the smaller yeah for what reason because uh, they have good training and they have the right technical skills but the hardest thing is figuring out how they'll adapt to the small company environment yeah yeah, yeah. and it's it's really difficult to know that yeah interesting i thought you would Maybe look for people who have had some experience working in similar sized firms or startups or developed something. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, mixed. you know, in Boston, you can do that. But yeah, yeah. in the UK or in Europe, the size of the talent pool is smaller. And so you have to be somewhat more opportunistic about who you find that has the right technical background. Yeah, yeah. And then try and find somebody that you think will fit culturally and has the right personality to mix with the the existing team that is not easy and takes quite a lot of skill which i think is underappreciated in what investors contribute and and part of the risk really in building these teams yeah, yeah. interesting and they're happy for you to take the lead on that so they get on with their science and then will you engage with them and oh yeah the team is always involved in that process but ultimately these people even the scientists are crucial in presenting the story either to investors or to potential acquirers of the company and so on and so finding somebody that has that right blend of technical ability but that can uh, present and come across well is is really important and really rare actually especially when you're dealing with people who are quite nerdy at heart yeah yeah and so how big are these like t um these firms at this, at this stage are you talking like you know group of like three scientists and then you start getting a you know, business person or yeah CEO or... most companies start about that three to five yeah and then grow usually to between 10 and 50 people okay and some of the companies are virtual which means that all of their activities are done through outsourcing by right, contract yeah. research organizations and some of our companies have their own labs you know in cambridge or in boston or whatever yeah, yeah. and they have a team of people working in the lab and usually a team of people in China, for example, making the drugs. Right. Um, is that where, where they're all made nowadays? A lot of the a lot of the chemistry happens in India and China. Oh, yeah, right, interesting. Uh, largely to do with cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, so where's the hub for innovation in the UK? Is it Cambridge? It's in Oxford? Cambridge. Yeah. I mean, there's what they call the Golden Triangle, which is London, Oxford, Cambridge. Yeah. And outside of that, it's fa fairly sparse. But Cambridge has emerged as the biggest cluster, and partly that's to do with necessity. So if you're getting involved with a very risky company that may fail, you want to know that your family and livelihood is not 
is not at risk. And so if the project fails, you'll have other opportunities to move into. Yeah, yeah. So you can keep your children at the same school. These are, sci- in- these are the scientists you're talking about. Yeah, the scientists yeah. and the managers. And the managers. Yeah. yeah um, it's not so easy once you get past a certain point in life to uproot your That's home yeah, yeah. and your children every three or four years. Because ultimately, if these companies are successful, they get bought. And then usually the team is disbanded. And if they fail, then the team is disbanded as well. And so usually the lifetime of a biotech company, especially in in Europe where there isn't the public market to float and stay independent, is five, six years. Interesting, interesting. So you invest in it, it survives for five, six years, they like the drug or whatever that, that they've invented, they buy that, get rid of the people. And then that that does happen quite a bit. Yeah. And once you've been associated with success, then finding your next gig is pretty easy. Usually yeah, yeah. these people are inundated oh, okay. with interest. I think the trouble is when you've been associated with a company that has not been successful, people are seem to be a bit more understanding of the reasons behind that now. And I think it's taken less personally. As long as the company's failed for legitimate reasons. Yeah. But most fail though, right? Uh, out of like, what, 10? Mm. Are you talking about one or two that, that do yeah. well? Or? Yeah, one or two out of 10 for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then companies either, you know, merge with other companies or they fold or they give their assets away for cheap to to other companies. But there's, there's an awful lot of... Um, mergers acquisitions you know uh, there's a flow of ip around the the landscape and and one of the things that people some people have been quite successful with is taking a drug that has for example failed in one disease and people have lost interest in it picking it up for cheap and then testing it in another disease Oh, okay yeah, yeah and actually one one area that that was hugely successful was thalidomide what's that so thalidomide was the drug that was used to treat pregnant women's morning sickness. Right. But it was very controversial because it created a lot of birth defects, limb abnormalities in babies. And so the drug was obviously was banned uh, from being used in pregnant women. But people realized that it could be used to treat multiple myeloma, which is a form of bone marrow cancer. And there was a company called Celgene in the States that, took up this idea and tested it in patients and got this drug they basically got thalidomide approved in cancer and actually as long as you're not a pregnant woman have uh, it's it's not that dangerous to take it and they built a business that drug was making 10 billion dollars a year for them wow it's an old drug <laughs> wow but also you've seen like cannabis recently yeah um mdma Mm-hmm. LSD, you know, all these illegal like party drugs yeah. that are now starting to be... Cannabis is a huge oh, area. Oh, man, massive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's... Th- there's a lot of hype involved. and but Is I think, there any, any like good science behind it? Yeah, there's some very good science, particularly in certain forms of epilepsy and depression and pain and things involved in with the central nervous system. Because, you know, these drugs... Uh, you know, recreational drugs are very potent, you know, pharma pharmaceuticals. And as long as you can iron out the negative effects yeah, yeah, or yeah. the narcotic effects, they can have pretty beneficial effects in, you know, in the right dose. And yeah. What's the coolest thing coming up? What is the coolest thing coming up? So uh, the thing that I'm most excited about at the moment is a company that I've been involved with for about three years, um, which spun out of the charity Cancer Research UK, which has a new way of treating certain types of cancer that have a particular genetic weakness. And you, they found this totally new drug, new new target, which specifically kills the cancer cells but not the normal cells and the interesting thing is that 
we think that if you identify patients that have this particular genetic background, then the chance of them being treated and cured by the drug is extremely high. Awesome, awesome. And how far away is that from coming to market? It's uh, it's still a few <laughs> years. Yeah, it's still a few years yet. Cool. And so, if you're <clears throat> last thing, if you're a if you're a budding scientist with some great innovative ideas, so the best place to be found is Cambridge. Is that the? I th- that's probably true. And if you're not there, then you have to make a bit more effort to find. So get yourself to Cambridge, then you'll get found by some investors or Oxford then... or, yeah. or London. Yeah. But, you know, to be fair, inventions come out of everywhere and it's partly our job to make sure that we're all over the place to find stuff. Nice. And if they want to be a VC biotech person, what's the uh, what's the best route? Yeah, I get asked that a lot, actually, by people coming out of or who want to come out of academia. I'd say the best route is... You know, you need a PhD generally, but then to work in man, some sort of pharma or biotech consulting. So, which I didn't do. So, what was that like? Um, a, a McKinsey or Bain or that kind of thing, but focused on the on the healthcare sector. And a lot of people will do that for two or three years, and it's sort of like going to business school, but you know, with more practical experience. And it's that doing lots of projects in in a medium amount of depth, you get a good idea of how the industry works and who the players are, which you don't get from being in the lab. So you you, you read, it's unlikely to get hired directly from the lab. It's unlikely, yeah. Unless it's at a very junior level. But there's quite a lot of competition to get into the venture capital industry because uh, there's very few positions and yeah, yeah. it's something that people you know, are attracted by. And so I, it's very important to have some additional skills. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's no, awesome. That was awesome. Um, <clears throat> thanks for joining me in the studio. We'll get you back in for another session. And uh, yeah, enjoy CrossFit. Great. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.